Francisco, eh, Kepa, and everyone for being here. This is really work in progress. Uh, it's something completely new. We really don't know anything about dilutions, but we're going to say some things. And we hope we convince you by trying to argue in favor of our position. So, uh, as you see, what we are going to try to claim is that dilutions are rational in a sense. And we want to claim that they are rational in a very important sense. I think, I, in fact, we think that they are rational in the fundamental sense of what rationality is. So this is controversial already, but I'm going to try to convince you. So the first thing we, we the first question that uh, prompted us to write these things is whether dilutions have epistemic value. And this question comes from a debate and a discussion in epistemology that is going on now. Uh, there is a lot of people who have claimed historically that dilutions do not have any epistemic value. And that if we want to look into them uh, for epistemic reasons, then it, it is just to understand why what is not know what knowledge is not right so if you want to know what knowledge is not go and see what dilutions are right but then there's a new trend in 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 epistemology of people who are trying to say that dilutions have some epistemic value and the main claim of these people uh, most of them is that at least we can say that dilutions are um, uh, epistemically innocent I think they call it like that. I can't remember the, the, the exact term, but the, the idea is that dilutions, what, what they help us do is that once you, you have a dilution, your, your system, your, your psychological system starts working better because it um, makes anxiety go away. So you can start reasoning normally. And that's why if they are not, not good, they are at least not bad in an epistemic sense because they help you go back to reasoning, to, so to say, normally, right? So what we want to claim is that it's not just that they have this uh, psychological um, status, but also that they have an, an epistemic status of their own. It's not that they are innocent, but that they are uh, rational, right? So uh, here's uh, how the argument will go. So. Um, there, the first assumption we're going to do in, in order to argue for our point is to assume that delusions are beliefs. And there's this other debate, a, a preliminary debate that we, I'm not going to address here. And it's the debate whether delusions are beliefs or not. And the two main positions are either they are beliefs or they are imaginings. And the people who claim that they are imaginings uh, are saying that in fact, when you go into delusions, what you see is that is people imagining things and they, they uh, misunderstand their imaginings as beliefs. But the explanation that these people are giving to how delusions uh, are formed and what they are, especially what they are, is much more uh, complicated and less parsimonious than the uh, an account that just states that they are beliefs. So we are going to assume uh, with them, with the uh, default positions, that they are beliefs. And we won't argue for that. We'll just take it for granted. But the point, and we will, uh, as I've already said, we will conclude that they are rational. And um, our argument is the following, is that um, delusions, when they start existing, what, it's not that they aim to recover, but that they do, in fact, recover our, our automatic cognitive abilities. So I'm going to explain this better uh, as we go along. But they precisely, they do this. They recover the automatic cognitive abilities fundamental for human rationality. So that is what delusions um, allow us to do. And this is, what I, that, this is the main argument, and I'm going to develop this in, in what follows. Um, so the tradition, something else that I have to say before I go on is that there are different kinds of delusions. Mainly, they distinguish between motivational delusions and uh, systematic delusions. The first, the, the motivational, normally are supposed to have a, a good like psychological status because they are good for people to start 
not um, seeing the, themselves as, uh, self, uh, how do you say this, um, auto reprobarse? People do that, and so delusions help you to have a better image of yourself, right? And um, those are the motivational delusions, and I won't be interested in those. We are more interested in systematic delusions, which are uh, delusions that come systematically, and they can be about any theme whatsoever. They, are, they don't have thematic, because the, the other delusions are thematic in the sense that they are just as on the self-image. They have to do with how you think about yourself, and uh, the others are not like that. And when psychologists and cognitive psychologists and uh, philosophers uh, characterize these systematized delusions, they talk about them in this way. They are uh, fixed, false beliefs held with absolute conviction and not amenable to reason. So if you read that definition, the conclusion is fast, and I don't know what I'm doing here. They are not rational, and the rest is <laughs> whatever. So, and that's how the arguments have proceeded in, in the literature, right? They, they are false beliefs. But there's just one point I want to make here, which I think is really interesting. And it's, you know, now it, uh, there is this uh, a lot of discussion in the literature regarding uh, the um, blindness to evidence of some of our beliefs, particularly our political beliefs. And they claim that they are group, that this is a group phenomenon and that what happens is that when you're in a group or when you belong to a group, you become irrational. And so you become uh, blind to evidence and there's nothing no one can tell you to show you that you're wrong because you are convinced of what you're saying. And I think that that phenomenon is just, uh, if you go like in a continuum, it's just another way of thinking about it's like the, the extreme case of that is delusions. You can think they have a, a common explanation, both phenomena, both phenomena. So that's why we're interested in this. In fact, I am much more interested in the other phenomenon, but I think it, this will sh uh, shed light on the other one, right? So, well, that was just a point. So, uh, but I think that we think, Axel and I, that there is a problem in the way uh, the phenomenon has been thought about. And it is because people have been thinking more about what is a delusion than about how a delusion is formed and why a delusion is formed. So if you change the question you're making, then the, what they, how you characterize them and what, what role do they play in our epistemic and psychological lives, I think, changes. And that's the point we're trying to make. So the first thing is that we think that the question has to change. It's not what are delusions and what's the content of the delusions. And that's why it doesn't really matter whether you have different kinds of delusions. What we want to understand is how they are, how they come to existence or uh, why they uh, start to exist. So what we're trying to do is to answer this question and by answering it, try to, uh, to argue that they are rational in a fundamental sense. So, how do they happen? Most people say that there, there have to be some things like brain damage, perception failure, reasoning biases, and cognitive deficits. Delusions are normally associated to all these things. And uh, these things sometimes, or most of the time, and particularly with some things like uh, schizophrenia, for example, or things like that, they trigger anxiety. So what happens is that people are very anxious when, when before having the delusion, they get very anxious, and then uh, this anxiety pops up the illusion, right? So this is, uh, so what they are supposed to be three steps to generate a delusion. So first you have this anxiety, and, it, uh, and the anxiety starts because we normally, when we, what, that's what uh, psychologists say, um, what we have is a, a world model somehow, and there are very different explanations in the literature of how that happens and what is working there, it doesn't matter now. But you have a world model, and then you start trying to predict what will happen, um, especially if there is something, you're, something important for you about to occur. 
So you start predicting what will happen, how long will it take for that to happen, and what happens before dilutions uh, occur is that all your predictions are wrong. So you start having one after the other prediction error. And that starts generating a lot of anxiety. That's how, this is not me nor Axel, this is uh, the literature, the, this is what the literature says. So, uh, this anxiety, what, how, what, what it does is that it crushes our unconscious predictive mechanisms. It just overloads them with, with work because uh, the more errors, errors you commit, commit, the more anxiety it gets, and then all your systems start being overloaded with, with, with work. They are trying to process all this false information, and they finally generate this belief, which is the delusion, which explains all your errors. So it is false because it has nothing to do with the world. It's just an explanation you give to yourself about why you're committing all these errors, and that gives you an explanation of what's going in the world. For example, you say, oh yes, there's someone following me. And that's why I cannot predict because uh, someone is watching my moves, so I have to act differently, whatever. It, it depends on what the delusion is about. And that, uh, what happens in that point is that the conscious control mechanisms take over the, the, the automatic mechanisms. So they start controlling and uh, they, what they do, and this is very impressive, is that they um, form a coherent, a very coherent story about what's going on. And then the delusion gets formed. But all your, your automatic mechanisms, once the delusion is formed, start working normally. But, but the, the conscious processes, those are the ones that are processing the information. But the other, so that's why, if you see, this is very consonant with the first hypothesis regarding the uh, epistemic uh, neutrality of delusions, because yes, of course, they seem to be neutral in the sense that once your automatic me mechanisms are, are freed, you can start working normally in the world. You just can move, you can socialize a little bit. Of course, the problem is that so socialization becomes very difficult because you have a, a, co a coherent, a very coherent story to tell, and, and you, you believe it, it's a belief, and you can uh, tell it many, many times, and it tells you something about yourself, about the world, but it does not fit with the world. So people, when you tell this story, look at you like you're crazy. And well, yeah, delusional people normally are seen as being crazy people, right? Um, and that's why socialisa socialization is very difficult, but they can work, they can do a lot of things normally, right? So people who are uh, deluding in this sense. So the operationality is recovered, and this is part of what we're saying. So delusions are formed to stop disabling anxiety. The problem is that they are not doing it in a really functional way. Because at the same time, there is a dysfunction going. The point is that there was a dysfunction in the automatic, more primitive level. And then the, the dysfunction moves to the, to the higher level, to the conscious controlling level of, of reasoning, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so, of course, there is something wrong going on there. It's not that people are just uh, processing information as people normally process information. There is some dysfunctioning. But the thing is, are you gaining something or not? And, uh, and that's where the belief is formed. And we think that we have a good deal. Because, yes, I know, sorry. And in fact, trade our automatic mechanisms for control ones. So, uh, we think that's a good deal, and in fact, it's not we who think that. Many people in the literature think that it's a good deal because it allows people to go back to, to their lives and to... Uh, the anxiety that uh, occurs before the delusion is formed is really... Um, how do you say that? It, it allows people... It does not allow people to, to do their, their lives, right? So we think that we get back the most epistemically, and this is something we have to argue for, the most epistemically valuable mechanisms 
um, or abilities in exchange for less valuable ones. So here we're claiming something quite strong. We're saying that the uh, automatic mechanisms are more valuable in an epistemic sense than the control mechanisms. And normally, if you read the literature and if you read epistemology, people would not agree with this because what they say is that rationality, uh, coherence, and everything has to do with uh, the upper level mechanisms, not with the lower level mechanisms. And uh, probably they are, they are right, but our claim is that those higher order mechanisms require to, to operate the operation of the lower level ones. So there would not be anything to work with if the cognitive, the lower level cognitive mechanisms were not working properly. So you cannot have coherence, you cannot have uh, uh, these uh, uh, reasoning, uh, complex reasoning abilities if you don't have the other abilities working. So that's part of the argument. Um, so the first claim is this is why they have some epistemic value. It's not that they are neutral, but they are uh, delusions. Once, once you have uh, a subject with this um, kind of problems, they are epistemically valuable because they allow subjects to uh, recuperate their, their automatic mechanisms. Uh, how is this rational? Why is this rational? So, um, we think that you can, and, and it's also not just us, that when you talk about rationality, there are different ways of thinking about rationality. And mainly you can understand three senses in which you can talk about rationality. The internalist, externalist, and what we will call the adaptive sense of rationality. So the, I, I guess you all know the differences, but let me go to um, argue for this. So what we're saying is that, of course, it's rational, not in the externalist, nor in the internalist sense, but in the adaptive sense. And this is uh, what follows. <sighs> I'm sorry. And he, it was so beautiful. <laughs> so, um, of course it cannot be rational in the externalist sense, because what externalism says, basically, is that um, if we think about rationality in a justification, epistemic justification, but rationality, what an externalist would say is that a person is rational if uh, the mechanisms uh, that um, form the beliefs of this subject uh, create basically true beliefs, for example. Not basically, but mostly. Um, and of course, if we think about delusions as false beliefs, this cannot be the case. It's clearly a contradiction you cannot be uh, rational in this sense, right? And also, if you think that there has to be no malfunction, then also it's not, it, it's not going to work because as I've said already, uh, there is a malfunction. Not the same malfunction that created the delusion, but the other which is that, that control mechanisms are being overloaded and they are taking control over all the operations that normally would be shared by the two, if you believe that there are two kinds of mechanisms. Of course, there are many assumptions we are making, but if you don't work with assumptions, you can just not work. So, uh, but in any case, it cannot be uh, uh, rational in this sense. It cannot be an externalist uh, sense of rational, of being rational. In the internalist, it's even worse, I think. We're in a worse position because internalists, um, would say, well, no, I don't know if it's in a worse position, but um, normally what an internalist would say is that you're rational if you somehow satisfy your epistemic duties, your epistemic, if you are being a responsible agent, and uh, delusional subjects are not responsible in the internalist sense, they are not satisfying their duties because in order to do so, they would have to check uh, for coherence and at least in principle what one would think is that um, if uh, the system does not somehow correspond to the world then coherence will go away. 
right? With time, you can, and the fact about dilutions is that the third stage, which I didn't mention, is, so you have the anxiety, then what they call the revelation, and it's when the dilution uh, uh, happens, and then you have the third stage, which is somehow keeping the, uh, making it, uh, how do you say, um, a more, uh, <sighs> making it stay, making it coherent with other beliefs you have, right? So what you have to do is to tell a story about yourself, about the world, which can incorporate the delusion. And then, of course, delusional subjects somehow have this. They call them um, auto uh, false autobiographies or something like that. So people start telling stories about themselves which are not consistent with who they really are, at least to the eyes of the others. And so uh, if you think about, the, about this third stage, of course, this cannot be the sense in which delusions are rational. But we think there is a more fundamental sense, the adaptive sense of rationality, which uh, explains and actually uh, really uh, can account for how delusions are formed. Um, as I've said already, the, our hypothesis is that the, the automatic mechanism, if they don't function well, then the control mechanisms cannot function at all. And so the, the basic sense of rationality is a sense in which uh, we think that would explain how it is that we can survive. That's why it's the adaptive sense. If you don't survive, you are not rational in any other sense of being rational. Of course, people can say, you know, there's a, a debate. This is a, na a naturalistic way of, uh, of thinking about rationality. And people can say, well, this is not a rationality. Because if you naturalize the notion, then it loses all its normative power. And it's, uh, <laughs> but with, uh, it's again, he's already saying he's not, he does not agree. But, he never agrees with what I say. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so but um, we think there is a normative sense. And it is a very thin sense of normativity that is underlying there. And it is the sense in which if you cannot somehow um, survive in this world, and that's what your, your automatic mechanisms allow you to do, then there is nothing you can do in the world. So we think that's a sense. Uh, that, can, that should be given more value in epistemic discussions and which has been forgotten. And there's people, there's some people who actually have argued in this way, uh, trying to, to defend a more naturalistic sense of rationality. So uh, what we want to say is that, uh, Solutions do increase the epistemic status of an agent since what they do is they trade more epistemically valuable abilities for less valuable epistemic abilities. So, <coughs> the lesions are epistemically valuable and they are rational. And that's it. <laughs> if the delusion starts in the very beginning to a stop, the anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, how can it be adaptive if I guess that having a delusion can cause a lot of anxiety then? So why do you solve one problem with another uh, bigger problem? So now it's, um, the delusion precisely stops the anxiety. So. The thing is that once you have the delusion, you stop being anxious. And that's why your, your automatic mechanisms can start working normally, because you're not anxious anymore. The problem is that you would get anxious again if you cannot form a, a complete coherent story. And that's why the conscious uh, mechanisms take over the, uh, the basic ones. right? So wha what happens, uh, it seems, is that uh, they are, what they are doing is that they are stopping this uh, anxious state, uh, way of stadium, 
And, uh, but, but once they start existing, you have to form a story that normally does not uh, correspond to reality, right? Uh, because you, have, you, you start deluding because um, you have a lot of prediction errors. So you would still have the prediction errors if you, wouldn't, if you did not form this belief that is false but allows you to accommodate your experiences. So delusions are helping accommodating the experiences you are actually having. Accommodating inside yourself, not, not with the world. So it's like the world starts doing what you want it to do, but uh, you don't get more anxious. You stop being anxious. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's just a clarif clarificatory one, so it's going to be uh, short. But I still don't have a clear idea of what a prediction means because it's, I don't know. I was thinking, I haven't read uh, much about those kind of topics, but that when you are predicting some things, uh, well, well, they are complex one or when you, but maybe it's because I'm confused, but when you have, uh, when you are imagining things that could happen, that uh, uh, it can happen that you are doing this, or one possible explanation is because it can help you uh, react to that thing that can happen. So then, what happened there that you cannot tag them as uh, as things that are not real? Or but I, I don't really understand this concept of prediction. Yes, yeah, so uh, precisely. M part of the discussion between them being beliefs and imaginings is that what happens is that you start imagining future events, right? When, for example, you are waiting for something to happen, you're waiting for your boyfriend to arrive, and he does not arrive, so you are sitting in your, in your sofa and, and it starts coming late, so you start imagining whether he's with someone else, he had an accident, he whatever. And so uh, what happens is that every prediction you do just is falsified. But then you can, this is, of course, this is my example. It's a bad example because probably you're not deluding and just imagining. And that's part of the debate, whether they are false beliefs or imaginings or what they are. But since delusions is, a, is, is an extreme case of this other, all other kinds of beliefs, so you have the, the case where most, what, what you end up doing is that you end up forming the false belief. So what you do is you, you start imagining all these things, and then anxiety stops in the minute you decide for one of the explanations, and you form a belief. But normally, the belief is a false belief. It, it has nothing to do with how the world actually is. And so you pick it, and you start uh, uh, behaving as if it was true, and there is People can tell you, no, but this is not true, this is not happening, that's not how the world is. And in order for you not to generate the anxiety again, you have to stick to your belief. And that's why they are not amenable to reason, that, as they call them, right? So you don't, have, you don't accept any evidence against your delusion, against your false belief, and you keep it. Because what it gives you is some um, uh, equilibrium, right? A, a psychological equilibrium. But what we're claiming is that what, because of what has been studied in the, in the psychological um, literature is that they are not only giving you these this psychological advantages, but also that since what they do is that they make your, your um, basic mechanisms work again, uh, that's what that's the advantage right so of course the predictions you do have nothing to do with how the world is you are somehow out of the of, of reality in a sense but you can work but normally they have to do with one particular subject not with all your life the problem is when you start deluding about anything whatsoever and, and that's a problem right and then they have to medicate and that's another kind of thing but 
Normally, if you start having uh, delusions about one particular subject, then you can have a normal, uh, well, normal, but a more normal life and, and delude about one subject, right? Okay. I'm gonna stand up. Oh. Aida? No sé qué es esto. Thank you for the talk. Um, well, I, uh, my question relates to um, uh, the notion of rationality you are using and uh, whether it becomes uh, so thin that it may be mistook with a uh, reasonability because it seems that uh, this response is adaptive because it is an appropriate response given the the conditions and the interaction between both. But to say that it's rational seems a bit uh, strong. And also, I think it may relate, um, it may be not uh, necessary to say that the delusion is rational, but to say that uh, there is something in emotional or affective processes, which is, I think, somehow what you are meaning by lower level mechanisms, that there is some uh, kind of, that the, the notion of rationality should be grounded there and not uh, necessarily the, the output of all this uh, mm -hmm. reason, emotion, uh, interaction or whatever. So I don't know, I was just, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly the, the question, <laughs> how to formulate it, but maybe, uh, I don't know why, but I would like to, to keep the, the notion of rational to uh, other things, just to, to have it clear. And I don't know if there is some advantage of doing the other way, I guess. So, thank you. So I think there are many advantages, and that's why we're trying to put this together. It's, it's really, really work in progress. So there are many things we, ha we don't have clear. But the no in fact, yes, it is a very thin notion of rationality, I and mean, people don't like it, and especially epistemologists don't like uh, this uh, thing to be called rationality. But the advantages, in fact, it is me, well, Axel, too, that I see in, in thinking of rationality in this way is that I think that normally epistemologists have thought about rationality in a very strong sense. And so, may very little people end up being rational. And you can sort of making, making, uh, make it thinner without going all the way down. But I think this helps explain um, a lot of the, well, in fact, I think that uh, if you start thinking that rationality has to do with upper level uh, mechanisms, then you start rational, uh, rationalize, rationalizing a lot what it means to be rational. So what uh, the evidence that we have in the literature regarding how we actually think about things and reason and all this kind of thing is that um, when we start rationalizing and when we, when we start reflecting, normally we end up telling ourselves stories to convince ourselves that the evidence is in favor of what we already thought was the case. So in fact, uh, refl reflecting or reflecting, I, I never know, uh, uh, does not really help in uh, attaining truth. And uh, uh, it seems to me that being able to move in the world uh, in a more adaptive way, I don't know if it will end up uh, attaining truth, but it does not take you further than rationalizing. And since that is the case, I don't see the argument to say that this other thing is not rationality, except that we have a philosophical bias. And we want uh, a very strong notion of rationality in order for most people not to be rational. It, it is us philosophers who are rational, and the ordinary people tend not to be rational. For example, and this is a phenomenon I am really interested in, and I think that's what I'm most interested in, and it's these beliefs, these beliefs which are uh, blind to, ev f f f about which we are blind to evidence. So these are political beliefs, right? So for example, they've made all these uh, studies where they ask people about, for example, things like uh, the w Iraq war in the US. So they 
put people and they, tell, they give them evidence to think, uh, to show them that it is false what they're thinking, for example, that the war was the only way out because whatever. And um, it's very funny that depending who gives them the information, the way they react, whether they take evidence as evidence or not, whether they are willing to change their beliefs or not. And what this seems to show is that uh, there is blindness to evidence. And I think that uh, that is normally taken to be an irrational um, way of proceeding. And so political positions are always uh, taken to be irrational. So when you talk about politics, you become irrational. And I think that is false. And so this is just a way to go in that direction. I don't know if it will work, but that, that's the intuition behind it. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> 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 no, no. Japanese, no? No, Margarita? No. Uh, no. Well, thanks. It was uh, really interesting. I, I think my question is similar to Aida's because I have as well troubles with this notion of rationality as adaptative or adaptive, adaptative. Um, and, and you say that it's too thin but my worry was the opposite that it is too broad um, because if you in some sense if you um, relate it with this idea of survival it seems that uh, all living things can be rational to some extent so is one of my worries. And, um, and so my, my, my idea is that instead of s explaining how this can be rational, why shouldn't we say that sometimes being irrational helps? Mm. So I think it's similar. So it's. Mm. Thank you. Anyone? Thank you. Um, yeah, that'd be it a good way to go to, I think. But I think this is an intuition that I probably needs more um, to be substantiated. But I think that rationality comes very cheap. It comes for, uh, almost for free. I think that it is like a... Um, of course, this is always controversial and, and, and it can be just linguistic because you can say rationality comes for free and then comes uh, justification or something like that. It, because it, when you're talking about epistemic statuses uh, and if you want to distinguish epistemic statuses, then you can put uh, upper the ones you prefer and in, in a lower level other ones, right? So some people say, well, no, it is just uh, being justified is very is very cheap because if you're an externalist, then being justified just requires for certain mechanisms to work appropriately, and then uh, being rational requires something else. So the discussion about rationality has to do not with those mechanisms, but rather with your capacity to explain your beliefs, for example. And so the externalist would go that way, and uh, I don't want to go that way because I think that uh, I think that many uh, living things are, in a sense, rational. Um, and yes, I think that the intuition is, is controversial, and I think that it, it would need an a, a better argument. This is something that I've worked in, in other places, and, and I've, I have a couple of, of papers where I discuss why I think that rationality, and, and it has to do with a very old debate with Cherniak, for example, who I don't know if you know him because he now became old because people stop reading. Philosophers are, they are like, in, in how do you say, the moda? They are fashionable and then they go away and nobody reads them anymore. But, uh, but Cherniak used to have this argument where he distinguished three ways of thinking about rationality and then he thought there was minimal rationality, uh, maximal rationality and no rationality and the minimal rationality sense was a bit like what I am trying to argue for here and I think there are many good arguments to to support this but uh, yes I think the way you suggested is also a very good way to proceed but the thing is that when you say that uh, sometimes it is good to be rational you have you you what I don't want to happen is that in, in, at the end, you're making a 
negative judgment regarding the attitude of the other person. Whether you say, yeah, it is good for some reasons, but it is, uh, but the, the, the value it has, but it, it has a negative value, right? So doing negative things has, a, 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 and that's what I wouldn't want to say regarding this kind of phenomenon. Again? Yes. <laughs> so if, if you uh, understand that, um, or if you say that autonomic abilities, like low, lower level abilities are more valuable in like an epistemic sense than higher level abilities, um, as we have said, we can uh, speak about emotional yes, processes, yes. but also we can speak about uh, uh, our motor uh, perception, uh, proprioception, etc. So, could you have you thought about uh, the possibility of uh, how could, uh, yeah, like motor behavior? Uh, be understood as a, in, not intelligent but rational and having like an epi epistemic uh, value. No, not uh, yeah, just this. Mm -hmm. I so um, I don't I don't know about emotions and uh, affections, affective. What, uh, I, I, because I really don't know about that. I, I am being like I've never studied that kind of literature, probably they are lower level. But I'm thinking about cognitive, and probably there are cognitive mechanisms. I have no idea. Really, I have no idea. But uh, if we think about, I was thinking about cognitive mechanisms that actually end up generating beliefs, uh, either because they, they, their output goes to a central mechanism or because they go, their, their outputs go to uh, another kind of mech what whatever the explanation you offer I think that lower level when I talk about it, it's motor and all these kind of things but also it allows you to make inferences regarding the world and so for example uh, predicting where uh, how to move right at least uh, and I think it is more than that so I don't think it is just uh, this mechanism this motor or approach it is those but it is not just those because they are playing some cognitive, important cognitive roles. I'm thinking a bit like um, the model of the, the mental model we're working, model to call it that way, is, um, has to do with this, the double system, the dual process system model. So you, you, the idea would be that there are two kinds of systems operating in the mind, and one of them are just very quick and they give very automatic answers, and uh, and they are very they help us. They are very good at for us to solve fast to solve problems really fast. And the other ones uh, play another completely different role, and they are also very important. So having that idea in, uh, in mind it is what I am thinking about. So um, this, the lower level systems would be doing uh, cognitive tasks and helping us solve problems. It's like heuristic mechanisms or something like that. And uh, probably emotions are there. I, I don't know. I would have to think about that and how they, are, how they would play a role here. Because of course, I, I guess that what you're trying to, to point to is the fact, well, I don't know if this is where you're going, but it, this uh, leads me to, uh, in this other literature regarding um, blindness to evidence, what ha people have argued that the problem is that uh, our affection, uh, like our emotions, are being are being um, put to play in our judgments, and that's why we cannot hear to other because we put our emotions like uh, in the first row or something like that. Um, and I. I don't think that's always the case, but but I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know what to say about. That. I think I have to think about this a bit more. Thank you. So I think now it's time for doctors. <laughs> Starting for the youngest ones. I mean.
Thank you. Doctors, not persons. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's just uh, you. You frame the the talk uh, saying that you are interested in how and why is formed delusion, and that the question of what is delusion, uh, it would be set aside. Yeah. Set aside. But from what you have said, correct me if I understood well, the idea is that to the question of what is, delusions are beliefs. No, so the what is question is answer. And you have given an explanation of how those beliefs come to be, something like that. So, so my question goes to what uh, does it mean in this explanation when you say that if they have epistemic value or not? Because if, the, the, if, if they are beliefs, they are false, we assume. So they are epi what, what do you mean but that they still have epistemic value? Because you have described uh, delusion not as, uh, as uh, you have described them as, as beliefs, but you give us as a process. You are not saying that delusion is a process. And as a process, uh, and you have defined that that process is still rational, and the conclusion is that it gives a belief. But how the delusion, if it's a belief that is false, still have its epistemic value? If you say that delusion is a process, maybe, I don't Um, so, yes, good question. I think that, um, let me think a little bit. So what we, the first thing is that uh, when we are thinking about epistemic, what we're trying to say is that the epistemic value of a mental state has to do not, all, not only with uh, its content, but also with how it is formed. And if, if you're an externalist, that is really clear, because what gives a belief, an, a, for example, what gives a particular belief an epistemic value, it is the fact that it was formed by a, a reliable cognitive mechanism, right? Or a reliable forming, belief forming mechanism. So it is not just what the belief says, but the fact that it was uh, formed by this mechanism. And this is part of, of the problem with externalism, right? Because you can have false beliefs which were formed by these mechanisms, and then what do you say about them, right? And that's a big, big problem for externalism. Um, and that's why we say this cannot be in the, ex it's not rational in the externalist sense. It is not that they are being formed by these mechanisms, because probably they are not, because there is some malfunctioning going on. Um, but the thing is that, what we think is that they can be rational because they are being formed by some mechanisms, which th the mechanisms that are forming delusions, that allow for delusions to, to finally uh, occur, are, are the automatic mechanisms, not the higher order mechanisms, right? So the malfunction when the delusion is formed is in the upper level, not in the lower level, right? So it seems that if you think that the, act, the, thi the fact that these mechanisms are f the, the automatic ones start working uh, appropriately, then that allows you, and if you think that they're working properly is what, rational, what being rational is, then you can say that they are rational. In fact, probably a better way of talking about them is, is not that the delusion is rational, but that the subject who is deluding is rational. Probably that's a better way to put it, right? So, it's not that delusions are rational. Uh, they have epistemic value because they allow subjects to be rational or something like that. Probably, yes, I'd have to think about that. I think that you can say that the process is still being rational yes. and that process keeps its epistemic value, but delusions would be survival value mm. or, so, or so, something not the way I want to go or there. maybe i don't know yes. it was just yes. a, a guess yes i wouldn't want to go there 
sorry. I'll, I'll hold sorry. this. You hold sorry. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go that way because um, then it's like what? Uh, Aida. Aida. And Aida. Yolanda. Yes, Aida. I don't know. Aida. Aida was saying. <laughs> But I, I was saying, and I don't want to go that way. So I still want to, to say that they have epistemic, and they're ep probably what I'd say is that their epistemic value comes from the fact that they result from rational uh, processes or some, something like that. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, I have some issues with your uh, adapting notion of rationality. Okay, I have actually two questions, but the first one is very short, and I actually would like, if, if possible, you to answer uh, with just a yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> did, no, I mean, <laughs> bye, bye. Did you just say that many times in politics the rational thing to do is being blind to evidence? That's what I'm saying? No. Okay, so I misunderstood something. Okay, so I don't know. I mean, there must be something that I don't get about this uh, the notion of rationality, something that very, very basic that I don't understand. I mean, if I got it right, the thing is that it's a normative uh, notion of rationality. Mm -hmm. So it puts some epistemic duties on us. I mean, duties just Not as a. Not Okay. Okay, so I don't know. Probably I'm completely lost. But if I got it right, the thing is that we ought to believe in some sense of ought. No. <laughs> okay, so I understand. Okay, so something I didn't understand. Okay. No, no, you are understanding. <laughs> <laughs> now I completely lost. Okay. No, 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 no. No, I think, uh, of course, that's why I think the talk has so many assumptions that, 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 yeah, it was too fast for too many things. So, of course, what we are trying to, to also discuss, and this is something that also I have done elsewhere, is to, to argue for a, no, for a very naturalistic notion of normativity where duties and ought is not in play. So, for, you, can, uh, you can say that norms are not uh, odd statements, but rather uh, statements that tell you if you want to reach an end, then you have to do something else. For, for instance, that's a way to put it. There's not an odd. There's not it's you all. No, well, yeah, that's a bad one. If you <laughs> want, it is, it is um, how do you say, recommendable. It is, um, so you they are recommended. No. One, no, of course not. Recommendations are not odd statements. And that's a discussion that you perfectly well know. <laughs> Why not? No. So this is tr there is this uh, debate in the literature. And the, norma the naturalistic way of understanding normativity, what is trying to claim is that you don't have to make odd statements, but rather just recommend, uh, sort of recommendations. If you want to reach an end, it, and if you do this, it is more likely that you, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, achieve it, right? So something like that. Um, but I don't, no, I don't see your problem. What is your problem? <laughs> Many problems. No, no uh, really. Dr. Chapartegui no, 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 no. has a question. Yeah, I have two questions, but uh, the you don't. You don't. Well, <laughs> I follow up. I follow up. Yeah. I guess if we are going to disagree. Uh, yeah. No, no matter what. So. Yes, we can. You can disagree with me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we can disagree with that. So thank you, Angeles. It was a uh, great talk really, um, and it was a real pleasure to hear you again and see what kind of things you and Axel are working on. And, and it, I, actually, I was uh, uh, glad to hear this and, and, and the perspective uh, of uh, the, this 
adaptative uh, rationality uh, you introduce here. And I think something like that should be going on because uh, if delusions are there <laughs> and are so generalized or spread, there must be something else, no? uh, something broken that this tries to fix or something. Uh, so the intuition, I agree with the intuition behind. Uh, so my, li my small, well, some questions are about this trade rationality. So what is what we are trading here and when do we win? Because if this is adaptative, means that we are not talking at the individual level, but a species level, if this is, a, if I understand adaptative. Yeah? So uh, that, that implies that uh, at the personal or individual level, we could lost or, or some, sometimes we lost. Um, at the species level, um, so, so some of the delusions are very uh, like, too, I don't know, like uh, too uh, autodestructive or su suicidal, right? So uh, why, I, why are there? So because there is no way to trade with them or and win. So, so what, what is there? Uh, so, and the other thing is also, uh, we are talking about individual, well, you have mm, false build, well, Individual, species, and social, or political, or community, or collective beliefs. So, so at what level are we talking about delusions? Because you said political beliefs. So, so we, so but most of our beliefs, collecti collectively, most are fixed, false, held with absolute conviction, and not amenable to reason. So, well, most, m many, let's say many. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, well, probably false, many, uh, about uh, collective identities or collective, uh, I don't know, descriptions of what this or that is, or we can imagine delusional communities, not that, so this king is the son of God, I don't know, so it's, it's, it's false, it's, it's everything, so I don't know. So, in that case, what lower level are we trying to uh, fix? Because it's not something motor or so something biological or neurological or whatever. It, it must be another rationality level. So, so when we talk about collective uh, beliefs, we uh, these two levels. Do you change them or not? So. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't know how to start because I can give another talk about that. So, um, yes, I'm going to start with the social part. So, Axel and I, we share this intuition that, in fact, the better explanation for the phenomenon would be a social explanation. But it would be completely different. Uh, and I th it would have to do more with... Uh, uh, communication processes and but we haven't worked that at all so no, I will say something about it at the end not, not what no it this 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 explanation is an, uh, an individual yes so when we're talking about adaptive it's in it's in the I understand that what you're saying when, when biologists talk about, and the philosophers of biology talk of, of, about adaptiveness, they are talking about, of course, a population thing and not as an individual. But uh, um, the main idea is that you have these mechanisms and, and you have them because they have been selected for and you're a member of the species, so you have these, and they're adaptive in the sense that having them for the population means uh, that they will help the next generation to survive, but if they help you yourself to survive, right? Also, because you're part of the. So it's a, it's really a way of saying things, right? But we're talking about the individual. So yes, in the different levels, we're talking about uh, when we talk about low-level mechanisms, it's it's what we were talking about, right? So 
But um, but I think that regarding collective beliefs, I think that's a pro that's a different problem because I think that um, what, when I was talking about political beliefs and all this kind of thing, I think that I am not thinking about group beliefs or collective beliefs, which are another phenomenon. Because when you talk about collective beliefs, the main idea is that they are states that a collective has, right? So the first problem is that you have to explain in which sense uh, a collective can believe something, can have a mental state, right? So, and you have to, to get into that discussion. And I think that's very interesting. I'm very much interested in that kind of thing. But, but when I am comparing this with the, that other phenomenon, I am talking ma more about my, pro my or uh, sub an individual beliefs, right? And I think that part of what you're saying is true because I think that uh, these kind of beliefs have to do a lot with um, identities, right? With personal and collective identities. So your personal identity depends a lot on uh, your collective identity. And that is very interesting. But I don't think that they are necessarily false. I think that, in fact, what happens is that um, the evidence is always um, underdetermined. No, uh, th our, our theories about the world are always underdetermined. And so the point is that when you have two different explanations of the same phenomenon, and you can, there's a point where you cannot tell which of them is false, right? So the problem is that you can have different uh, explanations and all of them be true and at there will be uh, one moment in time when one of them will be false and if there are two contradictory ones then one of them has to be false and of course we will always think that the opposite is a false one and that's natural to, to think that and I think we are always right right <laughs> um, and I have uh, many other things but but of course and uh, no I have two questions. Ah. Well, sure. I mean, some of them maybe I'm repeating some previous question, but one is about the what thing and the how and the why. Uh, ah. so it's a clarificatory again, because it doesn't seem that uh, your definition according to the how doesn't require the final product to be false. So it seems that you can, for these reasons of, you know, wrong predictive or wrong predictive yeah, basic, whatever, uh, you get anx um, anxious, and then there's a mechanism that helps, you know, or trades rationality in terms of, well, you can have r true beliefs that helps you, but for the wrong reasons, maybe you're not justified, that happen to be true. But then, you know, they are exactly like delusions, but they are true, and they work, uh, for, for, for instance, uh, you know, we go dinner, we park the car, we go dinner. We come back, we think we, the, the, the car is where we left it, but it's not. So that's like, oh, and then you make a hypothesis, and then you make one like, oh, they changed the streets. Mm -hmm. It's not us, it's the streets that have been changed by the Donostia government. And then, that's true, and then we relax, we say, okay. Or the other way around, it seems like uh, having formed these kind of beliefs, even they are wrong, can be not, well, someone said that, right? Not just that. <laughs> solves your anxiety, but the other way around. Say, oh, there is a world conspiracy, follow me, and you know, we're in danger, and let's run, and you know. So, and they can be true. <laughs> I mean, so it seems like they have, a, there's a problem in definitions of uh, what, I mean, true, and, and the, main, the mechanisms can give you true beliefs, but unjustified, and, but you know, work as epistemically valuable or something. Mm -hmm. So that's one question. The other one is, uh, some, perhaps because I don't know about uh, the difference about hallucinations and these mm -hmm. experiences that sometimes are the, the cause of having delusions, right? You hallucinate, so you start uh, forming false beliefs that at the same time. Um, what about, can be like, you can have meta delusions, like, you know, have, uh, like in the dreams, right? We all know this experience that you're dreaming, but you're aware that you're dreaming. So, 
I guess that the schizophrenic people, in my humble experience, is like sometimes when they say, come on, you don't have a CIA thing in your mind telling you what to do and talking to you. You know that. And sometimes I'd say, this, they look at you and say, hmm, this guy caught me. <laughs> I cannot fool him anymore, or something like that. I, I don't know how, how is the medical evidence for that, but you know, I would say that schizophrenic people, and mother, when they are having hallucinations, they can, sometimes they can say, oh, I'm having an hallucination. I think, I know it's not true. Is that something like that for delusions? So. Yep. Um, so the oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> You don't pay for lunch and then you want me to carry up? <laughs> You'll pay del pote because <laughs> oh, the, so the union of, of uh, recording television we will have that. And now it's his fault now you. <laughs> so um the first point I'm getting it better every time you mention it again and I think it's a, it's great because it helps us. Because of course, we don't have to buy the, the, the idea that they are false beliefs. We can say they are beliefs, and in fact that's what we say, but, we, but part of, of what we're saying could be precisely they are beliefs, but they are not necessarily false beliefs. In any case, they are, they are, if they are true, they are true by, by chance, by, by uh, luck, right? Yeah. But, but, it, but it doesn't have to be a characteristic of delusion, and, and in fact it is the case. Uh, they c you can be deluding and, and it can be, you can have a, a, a true belief, right? So that, that actually would help because it'd be easier to show that they have a positive epistemic status because falsity, because if we think that, that uh, the main epistemic value is truth, then we, yes, we have it very difficult. Mm -hmm. and, we're, yeah. um, and actually that's a way I could answer oh. Garmendia, Garmendia Uno. Hey. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so um, yeah, that's good. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that into account and then uh, work with that. And the other. <sighs> um, the Lucian Salus. Well, so. The main distinction that is supposed to be between uh, hallucinations and delusions is that hallucinations are not states but experiences. So you have a, a, an experience of nothing, that's what a, a hallucination is supposed to be, and, uh, and we could say that the experience, if it end up, ends up in a belief, it, it probably that would be a delusion. <clears throat> but uh, hallucinations are not the only source of delusions. There are many other sources of delusions. Um, so you were saying that aware uh, we can be aware that we're deluding. Huh? I don't know. I have not seen that in the literature, whether we can be aware. And probably what would happen if we become aware is that anxiety would start again, right? Um, and so they, they would not be uh, uh, like doing their function, but uh, like the other way around. But I don't know, I, I, I have not seen that in the literature. I would have to, to see if there is something, there, there has to be something about that. And probably, yes, we can be aware that we are deluding. I don't know if that's a meta delusion. Because you're not deluding that you're deluding, but rather you're being aware that you're deluding. Well, yeah, you could also. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I, um, I, I have to look for that. Well, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, a little question, thinking of the the way mm, the delusion happened. Um, sometimes when a schizophrenic or a person that has delusion um, is 
talking with you is like if she or he is not um, acting as is he has a false belief and then uh, see the reality in a way, but the process of inference is different. Like, it's not, we, I, I have a false belief and then given that that is true, then I can infer some things and I see the reality in order to, to justify my belief. And thinking about that is probably that have something to do with other kind of uh, inferences that are not a deduction, something uh, as an induction of an abduction that is probably more crazy abduction that other people make. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what it probably the way you, you characterize it is, is a good because precisely what, what uh, seems to be the case is that um, you form the false belief, and that then from that false belief, you start generating a whole story about what's going on. Right? And then you, you try to uh, make it cohere with other beliefs you have. And so the, the problem is that it starts getting very complicated because you have to make a whole story about yourself and the world and everything around you that fits to this uh, false belief. Right? And what kind of inferences you make? You can make whatever inference. It, 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 they can be uh, deductive, abductive, inductive. It doesn't matter because the idea is that once you form the, the false belief, the control processes, which are inference processes, most of them, start making inferences and start generating this uh, like very reflexive story about what's going on. And the other mechanisms, which are, uh, that's the way we're thinking about uh, cognitive mechanisms as inference mechanisms. Probably you could uh, say that uh, cognitive mechanisms are not inference mechanisms, and then our whole story goes goodbye, we have to say goodbye to it. But if you accept that cognitive mechanisms are inferential mechanisms, then you can uh, explain either as uh, they're going on deductive, inductive, or whatever kind of inferences. Yeah. But when you are making an abduction, you are not sure of your uh, conclusion. When you make a deduction, you are sure. So I think that more or less we know if it's a correct or incorrect ab abduction, but it seems to me that it, that f f is what is wrong with mm, is. Mm, but, but, but wait, uh, the thing is that. Uh, you know or you don't know what the conclusion is that is from a theoretical perspective, from someone else, not from the people who's doing the inference. When you'd make an inference, you don't know, uh, well, people in general, probably some of you know, I don't. Be I, yeah, it's true. Uh, when you're making an inference, you say, oh no, I'm doing an adductive inference, so the con if my premises are true and I reason correctly, my, my conclusion will be true, right? I am doing a deductive inference and, and the, the conclusion follows, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but peop ordinary people, they don't do that, they just infer. And then when you look at the inference from, the, from a third person perspective, you can tell what kind of inference was, was made. See? So since we're, we are speaking in a sense of what would happen from the first person uh, perspective, I don't think that would really matter. I don't know if I'm, yeah? All right.